So with that, uh, we can get started. Um, the format of the webinar is, you know, a bunch of slides and in, in between the slides will be two demos by Vandana for Sierra's software tools that help you specifically solve certain design challenges. And at the end of the webinar, it will be a demo on a PCB layout tool. I think it's Altium uh, in regards to some of the things we discussed. So it's a great webinar, ask a bunch of questions. If you don't know about Sierra Circuits or Sierra Connect, Sierra Connect is something we started uh, recently, which is uh, again for designers. Um, it's a moderated forum. Ask your questions there as well. Uh, and you'll get either an answer from another community member or an answer from a Sierra expert. Uh, so it's a moderated um, forum and we respond very quickly on that. Uh, and then Sierra Circuits itself uh, is a PCB manufacturing company and an assembly company. And we also manage components. And then we have our design team as well. And we do everything in the Bay Area today. That's me. So here's the table of contents, um, you know, really going through, um, you know, signal, power, ground traces, and some techniques. So signal power and ground traces all have distinct roles and you need to understand them to plan and execute your layout strategies um, for your high speed and high current applications. And you know, to achieve the, you know, the electrical performance you want, you need to optimize your trace geometries and your, your routing paths. So how do you ensure signal integrity in a high-speed uh, signal path? So first thing is to calculate your critical length. And that's the trace length above which the trace has to be designed as a transmission line uh, with controlled impedance. So the tr signal is transmitted without distortion if the trace length is less than the critical length. And the signal reflection might occur if the signal length exceeds the critical length. That's why it's important to calculate. So you can use these formulas to calculate the critical length of digital and analog uh, signals. So signal delay and impedance mismatching rarely matter if you have short lines. And so in this example, uh, you know, if you have a trace that's less than two inches, that would be considered a short line. And that's not something you have to worry about anymore. So 3 dB bandwidth signifies the frequency range over which the transmission line can effectively transmit signals without loss. So all signal frequency components propagate without distortion when the trace has a sufficient 3 dB bandwidth. If the trace bandwidth isn't maintained, some of the higher frequency components of the signal might get attenuated. And so the 3 dB bandwidth is calculated by, by dividing 0.35 by the signal rise time. And an example is given below. So you can do this or you can use our calculator. So I'm gonna hand it off to Vandana, she can demo the tool that we have. Yes. Thank you so much, sir. So Sierra Circuit's bandwidth rise time and critical length calculator helps the user to calculate the signal wavelength and most importantly, the critical length or the short length of the selected geometry. Uh, you can select the desired geometry from the dropdown over here. Let's go with coated microstrip for now and enter the dielectric constant, for example, 3.6. Uh, now you can enter any one of these four signal characteristics, uh, the maximum data transfer rate, faster signal rise time, maximum frequency content, or the 3 dB bandwidth. Uh, for that, you have to just click on the checkbox here. So let's go with maximum frequency content for now, and then enter a value of 10 gigahertz. Click on calculate. We can see that the wavelength critical length and the maximum short length here is calculated along with the maximum data transfer rate, fastest signal rise time, and the 3 dB bandwidth. Uh, if you choose DTR, for example, and I enter a value of maybe 5 uh, GBPS and click on calculate, the calculator 
of course calculates the wavelength critical length and the maximum short length but also calculates the other three parameters here that is the faster signal rise time f max and the bandwidth uh, so transmission lines in any high speed design uh, should be uniform to avoid signal distortions and crosstalk uh, trace parameters like bandwidth rise time and critical length can affect impedance matching which influences the overall performance of the board hence their analysis is one of the key steps in the high speed designs thank you so okay thank you oops can you see my presentation yes okay great so one technique is the serpentine routing and meandering for length matching so serpentine routing and meandering techniques will ensure signals reach their destination simultaneously. And serpentine routing involves guiding a trace in a back and forth snake-like pattern across the PCB. Uh, and this technique increases the physical length of the trace without significantly altering its electrical properties. Meandering creates a series of bends in a transmission line to adjust its electrical length. These bends help fine tune the signal's timing and phase characteristics. To achieve impedance uniformity, consistent spacing between trace segments, preferably three times the trace width is essential. Now, obviously this is not always possible with spacing restrictions. So basically do the best you can, but you wanna do this or try to do this to have consistent propagation characteristics of your signal. So also another technique is guard traces, which create a physical separation between the clock and adjacent signal traces on a PCB. So they protect the signal line from unwanted uh, electromagnetic coupling, ensuring signal integrity and minimizing the risk of crosstalk from neighboring traces. So in this case, guard traces will suppress the radiated electromagnetic magnetic emissions by providing a barrier between the clock circuit and the surrounding traces, reducing the system's potential for EMI. And they're typically connected to the ground plane or dedicated reference voltage. And again, they should be spaced between 3W to 5W from critical signals to maintain optimal effectiveness. And you just have to do the best you can there. And also make sure you follow manufacturing guidelines uh, based on your copper weights and what your manufacturer can, can do. Next, we're gonna to switch topics to uh, trace terminations uh, to prevent signal reflections. So first we have series trace terminations, which involves placing a terminating resistor between the driver and the transmission line. You should place the series resistors close to the driver's side and choose a value so that the combined impedance of the resistor and driver matches the trace impedance. And the termination resistor is placed uh, in a series with each line for differential pairs. So for example, if you have the driver impedance is 23 ohms and the line impedance is 50 ohms, to match these impedances, implement a series resistor of 27 ohms near the driver. The other option is parallel trace impedance. And in parallel trace impedance, a shunt resistor is added in parallel with the receiver. The shunt resistor connected to the power supply is called a pull-up resistor, while the resistor connected to the ground is a pull-down resistor. In differential routing, termination resistors are incorporated in parallel to the lines. We can talk about controlled impedance routing techniques. Um, so again, I just want to encourage if any participants have any questions, you know, please ask, we have, uh, engineers here who can answer them while I'm giving that presentation. So for control impedance, uh, techniques, uh, we have, you want to maintain a uniform trace width along the transmission line and to achieve your consistent characteristic impedance. And so when you're changing your trace dimensions, you wanna taper down the traces gradually to minimize any uh, reflection or degradation and to reduce your chance of impedance mismatches. So opt for thicker traces for lower resistance, uh, improves the trace current carrying capacity as well, and maintain the 3W to 5W spacing 
between traces to minimize crosstalk and ensure uniform impedance. So you have some grounding techniques. So keep the return paths and the loop areas as small as possible. Never split ground planes. When there's a change in the reference plane, include transition vias near the signal vias. Uh, create dedicated reference planes for high speed critical signals. Cover all unused circuit areas with copper pores and connect them to the ground plane. You can also uh, in, use ground stitching vias for high current and high speed trace designs. So here multiple vias are placed in a grid arrangement, creating a continuous conductive path around the sensitive signal trace. So ground stitching vias act as a Faraday cage and provide the shortest return path with the least impedance. They connect power planes and traces on different layers of a PCB. This creates a parallel path for current flow effectively doubling the current carrying capacity compared to a single layer trace. Via stitching also ensures a uniform current distribution and reduces localized voltage drops. So that increases the surface area available for heat dissipation. Um, so you can use the vias as heat sink, drawing away heat from, from any traces or even components. Ensure that the vias are at least one-tenth the wavelength from the highest frequency you aim to shield. Okay, so now on to techniques to achieve power integrity in high current tracks. So to design high current PCB traces, you need to identify the key factors as target current, which is the maximum steady state current for the trace, typically in amps, maximum temperature rise above ambient, uh, your copper thickness, and your target trace resistance. So using wider traces to handle higher currents as they have higher Ampacity and imp implement shorter traces that they offer lower resistance and power loss. So here's the formula according to. Oh, IPC. so sorry, to interrupt, but I would like to add over there uh, sure. that you know, you know, the primary the primary objective for any uh, PDN that is a power distribution network uh, is that we so that we can you know maintain the stable and reliable power distribution to all the components, right? Uh, so, over here, especially the AC impedance of the power supply rails uh, in the power distribution network is a very critical factor and it influences PDN noise. So, it is very important to, uh, you know, calculate this AC impedance of the power or target impedance of the power supply rails uh, to maintain uh, or to, to maintain the signal integrity, basically, of the whole uh, Okay, thanks for thanks for adding that. I think you have a demo coming up. So uh, let's see. You want to give your demo of the trace with current capacity and temperature rise time calculator? Yes, sure. Okay, thanks. Yes. Uh, so Sierra's trace width current capacity and temperature rise calculator is based on the formulae derived from the graphs in the IPC 2152 standard. Uh, it's a three-in-one calculator where you provide any two of the parameters between the conductor width, temperature rise above ambient, or the maximum current capacity, and the third is determined. Uh, it also computes the resistance at ambient and high temperature, and the voltage drop and power loss at maximum current. Uh, for the internal and external traces as well. Uh, to start with the tool, you first select the layer. Uh, let's go with external for now. Uh, the ambient temperature has a default value of 25 degrees Celsius here, but of course it can be changed. Let's go with 30 degrees Celsius for now. Uh, the standard value for conductor length is one inch and however it can be modified as well. Uh, now enter the conductor thickness. Let's go with one ounce. Uh, let us assume that we want to calculate the conductor width. Uh, so here we enter the temperature rise above ambient. Let's go with 20 degrees Celsius and the maximum current capacity, for example, 3 amperes. Now click on calculate W. 
So the calculated value of conductor width is 40.373 mils. And the maximum temperature, the resistances at ambient and high temperature, voltage drop and power loss at maximum current is also calculated here. You can follow the same steps for the, to calculate the temperature rise above ambient or the maximum current capacity here. I would also like to add that the current carrying capacity of a conductor depends on its width, on its width and thickness. If the width of the signal line is not sufficient, the trace may burn out and impact the functionality of your board. Hence, calculating the ideal trace width and keeping an eye on the temperature is crucial. And by using the tool that I just presented to you, you can compute the ideal line width and the temperature rise for a given current in a go. Over to you, sir. Oh, thanks, Manana. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you see my presentation? Uh, yes. Okay, great. So only a couple more slides and then we'll go to a demo and then uh, keep asking your questions. Uh, we'll have our experts on the line to answer after. Okay, so heat dissipation strategies, uh, always important. So here's some techniques. You, uh, copper pour is your friend. So have good copper pour on the PCB to spread heat away from high power traces. Um, and these large areas of copper can act as a heat sink. Uh, so very, very important. Um, you know, to add good copper pour uh, wherever you wherever you can. So you can also place thermal vias near the heat source to lower the thermal resistance and increase heat dissipation rate. Uh, include thermal vias directly under the thermal solder pads for circuit boards that are fairly thick. Opera via diameter of you know, somewhere 0.3 millimeter to a via to via distance of 0.8. Um, that would be you no know, extra cost on the fabrication side and help with your thermal connectivity. Um, so you want to also design for good airflow and isolate high current traces and components from uh, the low power sensitive ones. And then if you need to, you can choose PCB materials with higher thermal conductivity. Um, to, to improve the heat dissipation uh, capabilities. So another technique, so you wanna place decoupling capacitors near the power supply. So high power circuits experience sudden surges in current demand during operation. Decoupling capacitors act as a local reservoir that quickly supply this additional charge preventing dips in the power supply voltage. The golden rule for decoupling capacitors uh, placement is to position them as close to IC's power and ground pins. This minimizes the loop inductance. For high power applications, incorporate low ESR ceramic capacitors uh, with 0.1 or 0.01 microfarad capacitance. Employ multiple um, capacitors of the same value near the power supply pin. And when connecting multiple capacitors of different values to the same supply pin on an IC, place the lowest value capacitor close, closest to the device pin. So you wanna also design your, your vias um, considering the current rating um, so you don't damage your circuit. So you can increase the number of vias connecting the power path effectively to enhance the total cross-sectional area of the current flow. And this would reduce effective resistance and the voltage drop, minimizing unwa unwanted voltage fluctuations. You can also arrange vias close together to increase connectivity, reducing resistive losses and allowing higher current flow. And use through-hole vias rather than blind or buried vias for high power traces. And through-hole vias offer low re lower resistance and inductance, improving the connectivity and minimizing the voltage drops. Um, this slide basically says, you know, take advantage of multi-grid settings in your EDA tool. And here, kind of a quick summary of what we talked about. 
uh, and it wouldn't be a good webinar without some DFM guidelines. So uh, here they are. Um, you want to be cognizant of your manufacturer's etching capabilities. Um, everyone etches a little different. And uh, you want to make sure that, especially with the copper weight and the etching requirements that you have, that everything is good with your manufacturer and that you have sufficient uh, clearances around the copper pores that we, we've been talking about. Also, you don't want to have copper too close to the edge of the board. Uh, you can also reduce your uh, risk of any EMI, uh, maintaining a minimum of 10 mils. Um, if you're doing V scoring, uh, that cuts into the material more, so be aware of that. And then always be aware of your drill to copper, which is not usually a DRC in the design tools. Uh, so even if it's you know, a six layer board, you want to be aware of how close a drilled hole wall will be to the next copper feature on any layer. And those are the main things. Um, I would uh, like to switch over to the design team to do a demo. Do we have someone who can do that? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. So I'll be doing a demo on few topics. That is the wire shielding, uh, wire stitching, then guard traces, serpentine routing, and multigrade setting in LTM. So we have a board here, which is the RF board. It consists of SMA connector, the trace which is coming from over here, passing through various filter circuits over here. So definitely there's going to be a lot of uh, noise involved, EMI radiations involved over here. So now uh, there are different ways of controlling the noise. So one of them is providing the shielding to your traces. Uh, as you can see here, there is a trace running. So this is a 50 ohms trace. Uh, it's an impedance trace, single ended trace. And there is a copper, uh, which is poured over here, which is a ground ground copper. Now this is not a copolinear trace. It's just simple single ended trace. So therefore it is important that if you're uh, pouring ground on the same layer as that of the uh, single ended trace, then uh, 3W spacing has to be maintained between your copper and your trace. So always make sure that you follow uh, 3W spacing. It is right now 23 mils. It is because uh, the trace width is 7.6 mils. And if you multiply that by 3, it is 22.8 mils, which we have rounded off to 23 mils. So make sure that you maintain that. Uh, so that then coming to the shielding wire. So now select this trace. You can place the shielding wires. Uh, manually or as there's an option in LTM. If you go to tools, wire stitching and uh, shielding, go to add shielding to net. So the net is already selected over here. Now there is uh, the option of rows, number of rows. So we want only one row right now. So we'll select only one. Then uh, there is a grid. So grid is nothing but spacing between wires. So this is governed by the rule of lambda by four. That is uh, the maximum frequency that is flowing through the trace. Uh, you have to calculate the wavelength of that and divide it by four. But uh, that is the maximum uh, value, but uh, normally we take it very less compared to that. That is, we will go with lambda by 10. So we have kept it to 20 minutes, but that is how you calculate the value. Now coming to here, 23 minutes, but is uh, spacing between trace and the wire. As we uh, told you just now that the 3W spacing has to be maintained. So which is 22.8, we made it 23. So this one you can try it out. We are not using, I had shielding copper and the clearance cutter for now. Then we have a wire style. Wire style is nothing but the size of the wire. We have whole size of 10 mils and diameter of 20 mils. And we have a tolerance of plus or minus two mils. So there is option of top, middle, bottom. If you want a separate size on the middle layer, then you can go with that. And if there, there's also full stack. So full stack meaning it will, it will show you each and every layer of your uh, stack up. So you can try that out. Uh, the drill pair is top to bottom, which is a through wire complete. And there's also a shoulder mass expansion, which you can try it out. So for now we are only setting this much and just click, click okay. So you see that all the wires are automatically placed along the um, length of the particular trace. So this is called as 
uh, wire shielding to a trace. Then uh, coming to guard traces, as the sir mentioned, uh, that guard traces help you in reducing the noise. So there are uh, just for demonstration purpose, we have these two traces over here, this this one and this one. So which is separated by a copper, which is a ground copper mostly. So this might not be always possible on your PCB, depending on the spacing constraint. But if it is possible, I would recommend go with this, uh, just to make sure that there is a crosstalk is reduced and whatever noise is there will be grounded as soon as possible. And uh, one more thing I have to, uh, since uh, you can notice that there is spacing between uh, the trace and the copper, that spacing has to be again 3W. So it cannot be less than 3W, otherwise it will affect your uh, trace impedance, which will result in reflections and finally distort your signal. Okay. So then coming to wire stitching. Now wire shielding and wire stitching are two different things. Um, so for wire stitching, uh, you have to select the complete copper. Like for example, we have this uh, polygon, which is poured on this layer, top layer. And we also have polygons on our internal layers. For example, layer two is a ground layer. So we want to uh, stitch this together. So to do that, you have to uh, select this polygon pour, go to tools, wire stitching or shielding, and go to add stitching to net. Now there's an option called as constraint area. So suppose you don't want to select the entire region, only want you want a specific region that you want to select, you can click on this. It will allow you to uh, put in the area that you want, but we are not using it right now. The grid. So here, uh, in, when it comes to wire stitching a polygon plane, especially, uh, you cannot use very small uh, spacing between wires because it will result in a lot of wire. And also it will uh, result in, uh, uh, it will affect the strength of your PCB. So especially when you are placing on the board edge. Okay. Uh, so make sure that this spacing, uh, the spacing between the wires is here uh, is around 150 to 200 mils. So I have kept it to 100 mils just for demonstration purpose, but um, make a note that you keep it at around 150 to 200 mils. Then staggered option is there over here. So staggered basically it tells you that whether the wire rows and columns will be aligned with each other or the adjacent rows will be offset by, as you can see over here in the image. Then uh, again, wire style. So again, we have kept a whole size of 10 mil, uh, diameter of 20 mil via, and the tolerance of plus or minus two mil. Similarly, you can try out the uh, other two options as per your requirement. Then important thing is uh, drill pair over here, top to bottom, which is a through wire again, and the net. So you have to select the net to which you are assigning the uh, wire stitching. And this one you can try, try, try out, shoulder mass expansion that is applicable to the wire, and just say, okay. So you can see, all the wires are automatically placed. Basically, it will <coughs> stitch the planes on whatever layers the planes are present within this area. So the, the advantage of using wire stitching is it, it, it helps you keep all the different planes on your PCB at equipotential. It will reduce the resistance of your planes and it will also reduce the return path of your return current. So which will help you in uh, signal integrity. So it will improve your basically uh, how your signal uh, basically operates. Now coming to serpentine routing. So when you say serpentine routing, we are basically talking about length matching. So for length matching, you need a group of traces which have to be length matched together. So for that purpose, you will first have to create a class. So you have to go to design, you have to go to class. So you should be aware of various traces that will be a part of a group which has to be length matched with each one another. So we have created such two groups over here. So that is important. You have to first create the group, which is nothing but the class, then go to design rules. And within the rules, there is this match length option. So in match length, we have created two rules uh, for, as we said, we had two groups there. So we need two different rules for each group. And here the tolerance is 250 mils. So 250 mils because uh, it depends upon your application. So right now the tolerance is 250 mils. The, the tolerance basically means that the lowest trace, for example, in your uh, trace has a length of 1000 mils, then the highest trace length can be maximum 1,250 mils. It cannot extend, uh, go beyond that. So lower the tolerance, better is your, more is your precision. So that's how you select net class and the, uh, the class over here. Similarly for this, there's one more rule, which is applicable for all the differential pairs present in your uh, PCB. So as you know, that differential pair consists of two signals, one is positive and one is negative. And both of them have to be length match. And this is very critical and they have to, they have to be very critically length match. So that's why we have used a tolerance of only five minutes and you have selected within differential pairs over here. So make sure you do this. So these are the uh, important rules that you have to set for length matching. Then we have clearance rule. 
So we have used uh, 100 ohms uh, class. That is all the differential pair. And we have set a rule of 12 mins for track to track and track to copper. Why 12 mins? Because here our space width is 4 mins. We have multiplied that with 3, which is giving us 12 mins. So it's 3W spacing that has to be followed. An important thing to note over here is this one, different differential pair. So when you, when you are setting a rule for 3W clearance between differential pairs, you have to select this option. Otherwise, what will happen? It will start checking it between the positive and negative of a single differential pair. That is what you don't want. So make sure to set those rules and these are the normal routing rules. So once you have done all this and once you have completed your routing, you have to then uh, length match them. So to do that, go to route, select interactive differential pair length tuning if you are length matching differential pairs. Then you have to go to settings, we are going to use style as rounded. You can use other options also, but normally we go with rounded. And then there's something called as radius. So this again should be followed of 3W rule. So that is 12 minutes, but we have followed 5W. So higher is better. So we have gone with uh, 5W. And this uh, is just that how quickly it will increase or how, how quickly it, is, it will decrease. So make sure you select this uh, settings first before going ahead. Then click on your uh, trace and just drag it. Okay, just drag it and uh, uh, if uh, you must have noticed that uh, it becomes green so green means it has been length matched so it, you have to drag it until it becomes green so that's how you will complete your length matching similarly if i try over here a bit of a problem but uh, yeah so yeah it's not clear but uh, you can always adjust it after doing this so just for demonstration purpose i've shown just now now uh, one more thing you have to keep in mind that you have to also length match positive and negative of a differential pair if they are not matching so for that you'll have to use this option interactive length tuning and uh, again same setting you have to use 20 minutes and you'll have to click on one of the trace which is shorter to increase its length and pull it and right now it is not happening because both of them are length matched properly but if they are not, it will basically definitely pull it out. What will happen is that one of the trays over here will, will have a bump slightly outside. Okay. So the rule there is uh, right now the spacing is 4.3 min between these two traces. Yeah, it is 4.3 min. So after taking the bump, it shouldn't be more than 2s. That is 2 times 4.3 min. Um, that is 4.3 into 8.6. So it cannot be more than that. So make sure you follow that rule. Sometimes it is not possible. Then you can slightly go beyond that up to 3s but don't make sure not, not to go beyond three years. So that is how you do the serpentine routing. And those are the rules that you have to follow while doing the length matching. Then uh, we have uh, something called as multi-grid settings in LTM. So if you go to properties, <laughs> yeah, if you go to properties, yeah. So you say this grid manager option over here. So by default, there will be only one option available, which is global board snap grid. So this is applicable for the entire board starting from the origin. So here the setting is uh, 5 min. So suppose you want a different uh, grid setting. Suppose you are using a BGA in your board. And normally BGAs, uh, while placement, we change the grid as to place that as per the BGA grid. So if suppose a 1 mm BGA uh, is present in your board, so you can create a new one. Just say add Cartesian. Cartesian nothing but the mil and the mm differentiation. Just name this, maybe BGA 1 mm. And I'm taking half of one mm, that's 19.685 mils. So that is the <clears throat> grid size. And origin, now uh, we know that the origin, uh, actual origin of the global grid is set at the zero, zero point. This is, this origin of the new grid that you are setting is taken offset, offset from the actual origin. So whatever you say over here, it is offset from the actual origin. And then you need the width of your new grid. So from that particular origin, it will start from that point like 50-50 and how wide you want in X and Y direction. So, so suppose we want 500, the y width of the uh, grid setting. This one you can change as per your requirement, the color and the grids. And if it's falling in the quadrant one because both are positive values. So just say, okay. And you will see this. This is a new grid which is now formed, which we set just now. 
So that's how you can use multiple grids in your designs as per your project requirement or application requirement. It will be helpful for you. You don't have to always change, keep changing the grid. You just have to either enable them or disable them. So this is very helpful option in uh, LTM, which you can try it out. So yeah, that's it from my side. I, I hope this was useful. Uh, thank you. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, okay, now we are going to start the Q&A. I see that Atar just joined. Hi, Atar, thank you so much for joining. Hi, hi, this is Atar here. Okay. So, Atar, if you open the Q&A, uh, you're gonna see we have a couple of very interesting questions, including one regarding uh, Eric Bogatin. Okay, there are no open questions. Okay, like if you click the Q&A. Yeah, yeah, on the Q&A itself is saying there are no open questions. Yeah, I see three open questions. Okay, hold on. Uh, yeah, one question um, somebody has asked, is there a way to see the final lens in MILS? I guess you are referring to the LTM designer tool to check the lens. Yeah, it is possible. Um, I don't know whether I can show it to you. Um, uh, I'll just share my screen and show it to you, the option where it is. Yeah, so if you go to panels, there is something called as PCB option over here. So when you see this, uh, when you select the PCB, uh, you have to select nets over here, this option, and you will see the net classes that you have created. So, so you, when you see this, uh, when you select one of the class, so it will show you all the traces which is present inside that net class. And this is nothing but over here is nothing but the length of your trace in mills. So here you can check all the traces, their lengths, whether they have been length matched properly or not. So all the red ones are not length matched. Uh, so because this is not a final design, so that's why it is not length matched. So uh, this is where you will find all the details. I think that answers the question. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, great. Thanks, Abhishek. And uh, Ata, we have a question uh, by Juan, who's asking, Eric Bogatin often describes signal guard traces as having a worse effect on crosstalk on traces than simply having a spacing of the same width on a microstrip design where do you all fall? On uh, where, uh, uh, where are you reading it from? I'm not able to see the, the Q &A. Thing the... You need to open the Q&A uh, section. Yeah, yeah Q&A only I'm opening. Yeah. Is it open questions? Yeah. Is it uh, Mr. Vito Adranga? No. Uh... Is it is Mr. Keith Istrovel? No, I guess you don't see the question. You have to scroll up. Peter. Scroll up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Scroll if you can scroll a quick Q and A section. It's by Juan. I think he doesn't see the question because he joined only after the question was asked. Mm. Just, just a minute. No, I'm not able to see. There is a fourth question. Is it related to Eric Bogotan? Yes. Zwan, uh, Zwan River? Yes. Uh, River yes. Okay. Eric Bogotan often describes signal guard traces as having a worse effect on crosstalk on traces than simply having a spacing of the same width on a micro strip design. Where do you? all fall on this design okay is it better to put guard traces or simply just have the spacing i think the guard traces uh, are good for emi and other things etc okay so if you have very high frequency then the guard traces would be there and the guard traces have to be stitched also you know they have to be have some ground stitching and all that Abhishek, you have any idea on this? Uh, yeah, sir. Uh, 
it is better to uh, add the guard traces if you have space definitely that is that is uh, necessary uh, do not try to push in the guard traces if you do not have the space uh, make sure that you follow 3w spacing between the traces there is no space but uh, if you have space that definitely i would i would recommend to go with the guard uh, guard traces but make sure that you follow the 3w clearance from trace to polygon and as the sir said it is uh, is better if you if you can stitch the guard traces yeah yeah see the key point is let us say it's a long guard trace and at the other end it is open it is not stitched to ground then you have a problem then it becomes like an antenna and it can become a source of uh, further radiation okay so whatever the ground guard traces is you know uh, uh, rather the guard, guard plane and all that is more like a ground plane over there, okay so you have to stitch it at regular intervals at some intervals you have to stitch it to the ground so that it does not become an open-ended antenna that is the key point that i think mr bogerton refers to and that is the reason why he might have said that. Okay. Yeah. All right. What is the next? Is there any other question? Yes. What is the guideline to determine a value for the allowed temperature rise? What is a typical risk? It also, to a large extent, it depends upon the environment and the box, etc., in which the board has to go. But at the same time, I think 20 degrees above ambient should be good enough. Uh, if you take your ambient temperature to be somewhere between 20 to 30 degrees Celsius, then you know another 20 degrees uh, rise of the temperature trace, that should be okay. It'll be pretty safe. Okay, what else? Assuming the ambient temperature is high, what would be the safe? Yeah, if the ambient temperature is high, then basically 10 degrees above the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, if within 10 degrees, then you can design, that would be even better. It will be cooler. Okay, the cooler is better. See, the key point is that, you know, the, all your circuits operate at 70 degrees Celsius or um, definitely they operate at 70 degrees. So if you want to keep it below 50, that is a good goal. That's a definitely a good goal, yeah. But if the temp ambient temperature is high, then having 10 degrees above ambient temperature should be good enough. Should not, I mean, if you can meet your design in, within that, you know, spacing and your real estate and all that stuff, that would be very good. But otherwise, you know, don't exceed 20 degrees in high ambient temperature. Yeah, definitely not. Uh, does Altium change or taper trace width? Uh, that, Abhishek, you had to answer. Uh, I think I'm Yes. Tapering means that you have a width at one end and you want the width at another, let us say the width at one end is 10 mils, other end is 5 mils and can it automatically taper? Kind of make it make it rather than a, a rectangular trace but as a trapezoidal trace or something like that. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it is possible to taper, sir. Meaning, uh, depending on. So, how... it is possible to taper in Altium? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Yes, sir. It is possible in Altium. Okay, okay. Delete. Then, in that case, you guys can later on demonstrate that, or, you know, you can kind of send a reply or something. But it is definitely possible to taper in Altium. That is what you are trying to say. Okay. What is the best topology for I square C routing? star or daisy chain i think the daisy chain is much better uh, from the signal integrity perspective uh abhishek you understand dilip yeah um uh, yeah daisy chain is better sir because star routing will result in uh, uh, multiple uh, traces going out from single point yeah a lot of reflections can take place at the point where it is starring out 
you know, it is not only the rim of the via plating that is uh, used in passing the current from one layer to the other, but it is also some part of the conductive field that is also passing, uh, you know, taking, you know, some current depending upon the conductivity of the conductive field via and the conductivity of the copper. You see, that is how it will be different. Of course, if it is a copper filled via, then you can't have a better situation from for high current passing than that one. Okay. And uh, high frequency design, I don't think it has too much of an impact on that. I may not be very sure about it. And uh, how much better compared with a non filled via? Let me put it this way. If you are able to manage your current without, you know, filling the VR, then better do that. Many times VRs are filled not purely from the current perspective, but VRs may also be filled because of, you know, for example, in a sequential layer, you have another pad on top of it, etc. And, you know, especially in STI designs. You know, you may have to fill them. Most of the laser VRs are generally, uh, you know, filled in case they are, you know, another VR is stacked on top of that. Okay. Increasing the layer of PCBs can reduce the temperature. Yes, definitely. I mean, you see, it's a question of, uh, as we all know, copper has a much higher conductivity than the dielectric material. So the more number of copper layers you have, the overall effective thermal conductivity of the your PCB would be higher. If thermal conductivity is higher, definitely the you know the the, the heat dissipation will you know to the ambient will be better, and the temperature of the PCB will be lower. Good, good point. Good question. Uh, when you say T topology, uh, is anyone from the design team has any? Also prevent reflections in case of a T topology. We can't hear you, Abhishek. T topology, no. uh, primarily, possibly, uh, what, what does it mean? That means you are having a signal at one end and then you have two signals coming out of that? Uh, that is that what yeah, T topology? Like, uh, pulling out a signal from another trace. So. Uh, I would, um, I don't know, as, as we said, it is better to yeah, go. Oh, it, 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 it's like I stub. Yeah, it's kind of a stop, sir. Achha, achha. Okay. Right. It's better to go with daisy chain routing. It's uh, I would say do not try to create such uh, topology. Meaning, do not try to create a T topology. Otherwise, you will have to um, uh, at least use the what is that? Um, uh, the resistors. What is termination? Uh, resistor. uh, uh, let let, let me uh, let me answer like this. Okay. Yeah. It depends upon the speed of data transmission that is taking place on your. Uh, let us say I'm assuming that these are all, you know, control impedance lines. And when reflections take place, there is a time it will go to the T and then it will come back. During that time, there will be some disturbance. If the width of that disturbance is acceptable from the speed perspective, that means it's a very insignificant part of the bit width of the signals that are being passed, then it may not have much of an impact. Okay? So there is a, 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 a there is a, you know, a very small stub and then you are basically, uh, you know, terminating it at the same impedance, etc. Then it may, it, it depends upon the signal, but if uh, signal frequency or the pulse width. So, what Abhishek is saying is that even if you don't want to be bothered about all that calculations, etc., then in that case, it's the best to have a daisy chain. 
Okay. Correct. Yeah. Oh, so why don't you? Do you think you can demonstrate the change taper function? Uh, yeah, I can show you one option of uh, teardrops. I don't know whether you are looking for that. No, no, no. He is not talking of teardrop. He is talking of. Oh, okay. Teardrop is also something similar. Yeah, maybe, I, maybe. Kind of yes, similar. It will be kind of similar, basically. Right. So I think uh, uh, then I can take off, and you guys can do the demonstrations. Is that okay? Um, Adar, can you answer before we do the demonstration? Can you please answer the two remaining questions? Okay, which which are the two remaining ones? There's one that says. What would be the optimum routing guideline? Yeah. Two twenty four gigabit per second. Huh. <laughs> okay, you have to be very careful in two twenty four gigabit per second because you know uh, eye diagrams and other things etc will come into the play over here. If you really want to do that, and you have to calculate what is the bit width and what is the tolerance between, let us say, if you are trying to have batch pairs or the differential pairs, also, you know, what is the minimum skew that you will be able to, maximum skew you will be able to tolerate. And you have to maintain those kind of uh, lengths over there, etc. Yeah. And, but at this, at this speed, don't try to use single-ended lines. You have to use differential pairs. That is very definite, okay? And if you can use, you know, what you call coplanar, where, you know, that kind of uh, uh, geometry, that would be even far, far better with proper stitching it at uh, calculated intervals, you know, depending upon your maximum frequency. Okay, what else is there? What happened? Uh, there's one question. Uh, how rules are different for IMS? Mm. By Swati. How to decide thermal conductivity factor for IMS boards? What is IMS? No, no. The question is how rules are different for IMS? No, what is I, what does IMS stand for? Is it a material? No, 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 copper or aluminum base, PCBs, and FR4. What is IMS? I, I have still not understood the meaning of the IMS. Abhishek or Dilip, do you know what they're talking about, IMS? No, sir, I do not have an idea. I, I don't understand what is IMS. Are you talking of Indian military standards or what? Uh, I mean, I, I'm just giving, making a wild guess. <laughs> okay. Any board, I think we have, Vandana, don't we have a thermal conductivity calculator? Uh, we do have a thermal conductivity for uh, VS, sir. VS thermal conductivity oh, oh, calculator. Oh, 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 overall, let us say if you have a PCB stack up, can we calculate the effective thermal conductivity of the board? Uh, we do have a tool like that, but it is not launched yet. I think soon okay. we can launch. Uh, okay. So in that yeah. case, if somebody is interested and says that this is my stack up and I want to know the effective thermal conductivity, they can send a uh, request by email. Okay. Of Did course. we launch yeah. them too? Okay. But if, uh, I don't know, when you say thermal conductivity factor, uh, I, I don't, I mean, no, I, 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 I understand that you're meaning thermal conductivity as such by that you know the the coefficient thermal conductivity coefficient which is called the k okay in degree per uh, you know uh, whatever the uh, whatever the units are i think per watt uh, per watt sir yeah yeah per watt per meter uh, degree kelvin isn't it yeah okay yeah yes yeah watts per degree kelvin per per meter or something yeah Okay, insulated metal substrate. Oh, acha. Oh, insulated metal substrate. So you're talking of the metal substrate. 
also known as metal core PCBs. Okay, okay, we are more familiar with the term called MPC, PCB, MC PCB is the term. Okay, fine, wonderful, wonderful. So there, there is a way of calculating. Okay, you know, see the when you let us say PCB is composed of certain dielectric layers, certain copper layers, and certain metal core layers. You know, metal core, if it depending upon aluminium or whether it is copper or it is steel or something, you know, it will, most of the time it is either copper or aluminium. So it has a thermal conductivity. Then you can actually calculate an effective thermal conductivity, just like you can calculate an effective thermal conductivity of a ball. So if it is of aluminium, it has a conductivity less than that, but I believe the metal core that you will have in the aluminium would be roughly, you know, 10 mils, 20 mils, 30 mils, 40 mils, something like that, depending upon, you know, uh, how you designed it and how much of this thing. So it definitely it can be calculated. Okay, there's no big deal. The, the, the Basically, we are talking of thermal conductivity in the vertical direction. Uh, one, uh, the, the same tool, which basically is able to do the thermal conductivity calculation for the PCB stack up, the same will be able to do here also, because you have to assume that uh, metal core as another metal layer, okay, for the purpose okay. of the calculation and the thickness and the whatever its uh, thermal conductivity K is there, you know, okay. whatever is copper, whatever, if it is aluminum, then it will be as per the aluminum, you know, slightly less than copper, yeah. Okay. Okay, just two more questions by uh, Angelo. There is a, uh, see, when it comes to maximum number of VRs per square inch kind of rule, so we, uh, let me put it this way. <laughs> we have a design uh, note somewhere on the maximum number of VRs per square inch kind of rule, okay? If it is for the purpose of, let us say, transferring heavy current from one, uh, one layer to the another one. Number of VRs are also many times used to lower the, uh, I mean, increase locally the thermal conductivity. of. For example, this is, is an IC which consumes hell of a lot of power, like, like a BG. It has a ground pad, uh, or rather, you know, is a QFN device or something, ground pad. And then you basically, in that ground pad, you put a lot of, uh, you know, VRs over there, and those VRs go to, you know, the all the, uh, to the plane at the bottom, etc. So this is not only for passing current, actually it is more for passing heat. Yeah. So depending upon what is your effective re requirement, whether you want the number of VRs from the current perspective for passing heavy current in a power supply kind of circuit, uh, you know, uh, conductors, or you are talking of VRs called thermal VRs, they, called, they are called now then thermal VRs, then thermal VRs to basically increase the local thermal conductivity of a particular place so that the IC's area of that PCB doesn't get heated up too much and the junction temperature doesn't rise beyond, let us say, something like 110 degrees Celsius. Majority of the integrated circuits, you know, the junction temperature maximum operating is roughly given in most of the data sheets is 125, but it's better to keep it as low as possible. Okay, I mean, definitely should not... Uh, I mean, in most cases, should not try to exceed it 100 degrees Celsius. So, it may help. That is what we call as the thermal pad. And then basically through the VRs, you transfer the heat or conduct the heat away as quickly as possible through metallic VRs, through VRs. So, depending upon what is the application, the number of VRs can be calculated. We have some design rules over here. And uh, the uh, definitely uh, uh, the leap, I think we'll have to make the tools for those. Okay. Okay. Thus, going from 5 mil trace width to 4 mil width, one ounce is still 
the threshold for increased cost in general? Let me put it this way. A thinner trace with a heavier copper is, is very difficult. Okay, it's far more expensive. All right. If you are having one ounce copper, you better limit yourself to five mils or something. Okay. What else? Assuming, uh, what is the guideline to determine the value that for the allowed temperature? Okay, that I think we already uh, What would be the safe? Uh, the last question is by War uh, Warren Johnson. Okay. Can you recommend a preferred, Can you recommend a preferred low cost dia dielectric material that can be used for 16 gigabit like PCIe generator? Okay, okay. I think 16 gigabit uh, PCI, I, 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 what possibly you're saying is, uh, then I think a material like, uh, you know, any of the uh, high-speed materials, the medium range high-speed material should be fine for this one. Okay, thank fine. you very much, Fatah. Thank you very much, everyone. If you have more questions, you can ask on Sierra Connect. I will send you the link, okay? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you, the design team, for joining. Thank you, Vandana, for the demos. Bye-bye, guys. Bye-bye, everyone.